will be uh, David Hill. David. Thank you, Dr. Pisani. Uh, my talk today uh, is just to give you an introduction to myself uh, and my work, um, where I attempt to understand large-scale environmental systems uh, with real-time observations. Um, I got my bachelor's degree at Cornell University, uh, and then on completing uh, my, my undergraduate work, I went on to join the uh, graduate program at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Uh, my master's research, uh, I uh, developed uh, solid transport models for nutrients in flowing through the subsurface of agricultural fields in the Midwest. And the point of that was to uh, try to quantify the, um, uh, the contributions of nutrients uh, from agricultural practices, primarily corn and soybean rotations, uh, towards the total nutrient load in the Mississippi River, which ultimately ends up uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, causing uh, low oxygen conditions known as hypoxia, um, and uh, the, the seasonal dead zone uh, that emerges uh, primarily in the summer and during the warm uh, weather. Uh, during that research, I became really fascinated by how uh, very small spatial scale processes like uh, water flowing uh, in and around soil grains can impact things on the scale of the continental United States. And that really drove me uh, in my PhD work to try to understand uh, large-scale systems like uh, the entire uh, Mississippi River Basin um, and to try to understand how we could better forecast what's going on there and better understand how the interactions between multi-scale processes uh, result in the uh, phenomena that are most important from the standpoint of environmental sustainability. These are things like flooding um, and, and uh, natural disasters as well as um, uh, anthropogenic things like this uh, hypoxia event. After my uh, PhD, I worked for two years uh, at the National Center for Supercomputing Applications as a postdoc. Um, and during that time, I was developing internet technology to facilitate uh, collaboration and real-time data acquisition and processing uh, in support of uh, the creation of decision support systems for managing urban uh, environments and primarily towards managing uh, urban flood water. And this is a really important and timely uh, task, seeing as the projections for uh, global climate change will, uh, are to increase the uh, frequency and intensity of rainfall. So uh, urban systems with high degrees of imperviousness are going to be subject to more intense flooding events. Um, and then starting this year, I'm now an assistant uh, professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. So to sort of sum up my uh, research in a, in a few slides, I wanted to start uh, just with the, uh, the process that got me where I am, which is to discuss how things, uh, how the processes at multiple spatial scales affect large scale behaviors. So let's uh, think about urban flooding, for example. And urban flooding is really a result of the difference between the percolation of rainfall into the soil and the runoff of rainfall into surface water bodies. And here we have a, a, a small a section of soil. The soil is divided into two strata. And you have aggregates of different sizes. Uh, up in the, the uh, near surface zone, you have roots that are penetrating the soil, creating cracks and fissures that affect the permeability. Uh, if we were to uh, model this type of system, it might be possible to resolve all of these scales of heterogeneity simply because of the system's very, very small size. Now, if this system is part of a larger system, it's a, it's a component, for example, in a green roof. And a green roof is a, a best management practice for reducing imperviousness in urban areas and thus reducing uh, urban flooding events. Uh, and when you get to this scale, now in addition to all the heterogeneity I just described, you now have heterogeneity on another scale. And this is more of the human scale. We have buildings, we have uh, footpaths, and we have the impacts of humans on the environment. Because this is really the scale at which humans can directly manipulate uh, the, the processes of infiltration. Okay. And again, in modeling at this scale, it, if, if you're trying to resolve all of the heterogeneity I've thus described, it might be possible. Again, because you're limited in, in scope to maybe on the order of tens of, of meters, uh, hundreds of meters, hundreds of square meters. But for the implications of urban flooding to really be known, for them to really understand how it impacts uh, human health and the environment, 
we need to start looking at the urban system as a whole. And at this point, it becomes very impractical to resolve uh, soil grains and to resolve pore spaces. And we need to develop new kinds of models that are efficient so that we can understand how the uh, behaviors at those small scales affect things on the order of uh, entire cities or continents. Um, and this is really the scale that I focus my research on, and this is a scale that is really important uh, from the standpoint of understanding and managing environmental sustainability. How do we do this? Um, well, thankfully, we have a lot of help uh, coming up in, in the technology sector. There's a lot of development in sensors and telemetry, and we can actually go out into the environment now. We can make the world our laboratory by embedding sensors into the environment, by putting satellites into the sky, by using uh, uh, timely uh, air, uh, airplane overflights to take measurements of the environment as things are occurring. So uh, we, can, we can take sensors that are embedded in the environment and nest them in certain ways so we can understand scaling relationships. Uh, we can look at things in spatial, spatial and temporal resolutions that were never before possible. Uh, and so with my research, I try to answer uh, the, this question. How can we use real-time sensing, modeling, and analysis of large-scale environmental systems to better understand and adaptively manage them in sustainable ways? And this question can really be divided up into two basic, uh, two general thrusts. One is how do we get from data about the environment we're studying to knowledge that helps us do management and helps us understand these environmental processes? And secondly, how can we do this on a large scale? And the large scale question really brings in how can we collaborate with other researchers? How can we understand how our impacts here in the United States affect uh, Mexico to the south within our continent or Europe, for example? Um, and several aspects of these problems have been identified by the National Research Council to be critical for the advancement of environmental science and engineering. Now, uh, this slide sort of lays out my vision for how we can, how we can do this. First, we have uh, our sensors that are in the environment. Uh, this is, uh, for example, we have, this is a weather radar. Uh, when you turn on the, the, the morning news and you see the, the, the rainfall patterns that are coming out of these uh, Nexrad WSR 88D radars. We have a wind profiler. This is a research platform that I worked with, which was measuring um, oxygen content and nutrient loads in uh, the Gulf of Mexico. And then we have infrastructural sensors. We're at a state of readiness where these sensors exist uh, for, to some extent, primarily for physical properties of the environment, and are, are deployed. We have a very good network of uh, weather radar. We have a pretty good network of uh, rain gauge sensors. We have a pretty good network of, um, of, uh, of, of wind speed, et cetera, especially related with, um, with uh, uh, airports. Um, but we don't really have too much in the way of chemical and, and biological sensors. Some chemical sensors are on the verge of being created, but to be able to identify biological concentrations in waters, those types of sensors are really the, the, uh, the cutting edge of, of sensors that are, are being developed right now in, uh, in universities. So when you have these, this is sort of where we're at now, and we have some telemetry that, uh, that can send these data out in real time. And so where I'm starting is, is right about in here, where these data are, are being produced, they're being created, and they're coming in, and we want, to, we want to capture them in real time and be able to perform in an online environment a data cleaning, transformation, aggregations, and fusion so that we can bring the data together, we can, we can get a synoptic view of the environment that's being monitored. And then these uh, transformed data become very useful data products themselves, which can be passed out of the system in a real-time uh, incremental way. This becomes as if it were a new sensor. It becomes uh, what I'm terming a virtual sensor. The data from the virtual sensor then can be brought into a suite of modeling optimization and visualization tools. This uh, suite is really uh, the, the framework for a decision support system. The results of, the decision, of, of these kinds of, uh, of, of pro uh, practices can be used for uh, management, they can be used for adaptive sensing, they can be used for sensor network design. So, uh, some, just a few uh, collaboration possibilities that I see from my work are uh, in developing uh, methods for real-time analysis of spatiotemporal data streams. Environmental behaviors are, are very ill-defined, and another interesting thing about them is we're primarily interested in the extreme events, not the mean behaviors. How can we mine these uh, behaviors out of the data we're, we're collecting? Um, also in emerging sensor uh, sensing technology, um, 
primarily uh, uh, biological sensors are of interest to me. And again, in web portals and web services for ingesting, transforming, transforming and publishing live data. And this really helps us to do uh, online collaboration. And that's all I've prepared. I'd like to answer any questions if you have them. Thank you. Uh, primarily, what I've been working on is the question of doing uh, a fusion, where you bring together multiple types of data. And I've been doing that using uh, Bayesian framework, and, and specifically dynamic Bayesian networks, in the hybrid domain, because you have both continuous and discrete variables. Okay. Yeah. okay. Thank you very much.